Hello! Today I would like to show you some megaliths that are relatively less famous but not the less interesting than the very famous ones. For example, Castle Montfort, where again the walls of primitive stonework are built on the top of older bases which has been with much more precision and larger blocks. And the megaliths of the Temple Mount. These blocks on the right side weighed more than 600 tons, and yet they are assuring us that it was all built with the help of this type of cranes. Castle Montfort At first sight, there is nothing special in the stonework. The stones are not that big and there is not much of a sophistication in the quality of the stonework itself. But when one looks carefully, it appears that there are two layers of stonework. This is the older one. It is visibly darker, which means it has been exposed longer to the elements. And in addition, the darker stones are much larger and they fit very well with each other without the need of any mortar. The brighter colored reddish walls were clearly built around something that was already a ruins or something that had originally a completely different design than what we see now, like this big chunk, eight cornered megalithic uh, structure, actually a couple of them Clearly, if you see how the walls are built next to them, it doesn't fit the original idea. These eight corner things were not made with the intention to put monkey quality work that would cover them later on. Although it is pretty obvious that we have at hand the structure that has been built on the top of something older, the official quackademics pretend not to notice it and confidently assure us that it was all built by the Templar Knights. And as far as uh, what was there before that, they know everything, of course. They bought the land from a farmer and there was something very insignificant before that. Something like farmer's shed or maybe even his farmhouse. Very interesting, so I assume the wife of this farmer must have had interest in arts, so she must have sponsored those uh, megalithic uh, things. But I would find hard to believe it after all, because what would farmers do on the top of the mountains? Don't they live? where they can find easily water to water their plants in the valleys where, by the way, also the land is flat and you don't need to make terraces to garden No wonder that only minimal excavations have been conducted at the site and those were many years ago, 
Why would you dig if you don't want the people to know the real history? But they built this uh, wall on the right side for the purpose of exciting the imagination of the tourists. Well, this time they were pretty straightforward and honest and they frankly told us what are all their quackademics stories all about exciting the imagination, not about finding out the truth about our history. Below the mostly red-colored ruins on the top lie large stones that were part of the original old construction and fell down here when it was destroyed. The picture is very similar to that of the Nimrod fortress, which I showed in uh, one of my recent videos. Although Castle Montfort is not as impressive and as big as uh, the Nimrod fortress, they clearly belong to the same style, the style of Baalbek, and they met the same fate, both of them and Baalbek as well, because that was the fate of uh, Baalbek too. It was uh, rebuilt and destroyed a number of times. And where is Castle Montfort located anyway? Looking at the Gothic arches, I would guess maybe somewhere in France? But no, it is in the heart of the Middle East. What is it doing there? The official answer to this question is, of course foreigners must have come and built it. Is there any other way? But looking at the amount of uh, fortresses in and castles in this full region, in this style, it becomes clear that they are just so numerous that there must have been so many so-called foreigners that actually the right wording for this would be the local population. Everybody has heard about Baalbek, the mysterious Baalbek. But very often it is presented as some sort of an isolated example to make it look more mysterious. But in reality, there are many structures that are built in the exactly same style. On the left hand side, you see one of those Baalbek style trilitons, enormous stones, and all this is in the underground portion of the Temple Mount of Jerusalem. This is one enormous huge stone. Was this stone quarried and then transported? Or was it just cast out of cement, beton, geopolymer, something like that? We don't know. There is a port also allegedly built by Herod the Great who allegedly built the Temple Mount uh, the way we see it nowadays. So over there a group of American historians, um, after studying it, reached the conclusion that um, Herod the Great was uh, actually casting that port out of uh, beton. I don't know if that's true, but uh, there is a possibility that um, casting stone and uh, quarrying it were used uh, parallel along each other, like in the case of uh, Egypt. The tests and the experiments by Joseph uh, Davidovich in relation to the uh, origin of the Giza stones used in the Great Pyramid of Giza is uh, very interesting in terms of uh, using geopolymers in ancient uh, building. Actually, the underground of the Temple Mount, of course, we have an access to a very small portion of it, but even that is it places few stories deep with all kinds of things inside. Very often on the ancient uh, megalithic structures we see 
those typical holes so apparently they were used to insert uh, wooden beams in them apparently few pieces were left behind and they got petrified And here on the side of the Temple Mount, the penguins built a crane for us to show us so that we don't wonder how people were shifting all those heavy blocks. This is how they did it. In the Aris of the Wonderland of the Penguins and these are some real life cases. Pay attention what kind of number of people are required to shift a relatively small building block in terms of uh, the sizes that we see at Baalbek and the Temple Mount and all the structures belonging to that group and decide for yourself is it uh, reasonable to suggest that uh, entire megalithic complexes and we have quite few of them all around the world would have been uh, built in the primitive way the quackademics are assuring us it all happened well the population simply wouldn't have been enough for it there wouldn't have been in addition to that enough place on the building sites for all these groups of imaginary men pulling a single stone. In addition, the complexes themselves uh, wouldn't be finished in a reasonable amount of time, like, let's say, at most, the lifespan of a human being. I mean, it, people don't plan uh, buildings that would be completed after five generations. So here, all that uh, mile-long procession of ants pulling, what were they pulling? A relatively small stone. And we're not talking about uh, just uh, a handful of uh, huge stones in the underground chambers. The entire complex of the Temple Mount is actually quite big and impressive, enormous megalithic structure. It obviously belongs again to the Baalbek group of sites. The style is identical to that of Baalbek and the size of the blocks as well. And its story seems to again resemble that of uh, Baalbek and the Nimrod fortress and all the others. Initially the original huge structure was destroyed and its large components lie scattered around. They don't want to uh, dig and excavate them fully. They are not interested in uncovering the real history of the Temple Mount and uh, instead bamboozle people with uh, unbelievably funny stories actually that I'm gonna tell you shortly. For example, this is a rare case in which one can get a glimpse of what lies below buried. The wall on the right side, which it places, is up to 10 meters revealed and that is not the bottom of it yet. So next to it on the left side, 
there is another wall which has been placed later because again we have uh, multiple layers of uh, building obviously the one on the left belongs to the more recent periods because it is of monkey quality so all of this makes one wonder if even the more relatively more recent walls reach 10 meters deep and that's not the end, then what about the real bottom? Here they actually made even a lift to get down to the current bottom where to which they have uh, excavated. And again, this image is very informative. Just compare the quality of the old work on the right side with the wall on the left and they are telling us that they were built at the same time by a king called Herod the Great. And with great confidence the Quackademics will provide you exact years in which everything happened and other minor details how they were making offers to the god while they were building it. And I even read this today. It's an amazing joke. Actually the priests built it. It was so sacred. So, okay, the priests built those megaliths using this crane. Great! So, let me tell you more jokes about Herod the Great, because they are just fantastic. So, this is again in the complex of the Temple Mount. We see ruins of uh, something that remarkably resembles actually the Osirian of Egypt. And behind this Osirian like something, you can see there are excavations and there are remains of that wall, the bottom of which has not been reached yet by any of the excavations. So, when we put all this together, it turns out that uh, Herod the Great built this wall and then buried it with at least 10 meters thick layer of soil. And then on the top of that soil he built his Osirian-like structures. How smart! And then while Herod the Great was planning all these smart moves, his priests who were building the temple apparently weren't that good in shifting megaliths with uh, toy-sized cranes, so he must have cooked a few batches of them into sacrificial offerings for the gods. And that explains uh, why different portions of his uh, complex appear to be built as if by people who have never met each other, like completely different building standards. There are also this type of uh, structures in the Temple Mount complex, absolutely primitive work. Apparently the later batches of uh, priests were not that good. And I don't know what kind of priests he sent to build the other buildings that allegedly belong to him according to the Quackademics, buildings that are also attributed to Herod the Great. I mean, they are of such a quality that there isn't a single proper right angle in them. This type of chaotic low-grade construction can barely compare to the precise work at the lower layers of the Temple Mount, where we have a single stone with such a large surface and it is very, uh, very well measured. It is not wavy, it is very perfectly flat, although not polished, it is flat. But apparently such details don't make the penguins think that uh, actually this could be a work of uh, different people. So what's going on on the east side of the Temple Mount? It is locked, closed, no access at all, even with bribe. 
So we are told officially that the Arabs are building mosque over there. And so these are some sort of uh, ramps, modern, that are being built in order to facilitate the visitors of the future mosque. Now, what's going on in reality, as reported by the Russian group of Lai, is that apparently there is some sort of uh, serious equipment for cutting stone down there, because from inside they are dragging stone for this ramp. And what kind of stone is that? It appears that these are chopped off ancient big blocks. The cutting marks that you see on the stone are modern. This is an example of ancient columns that came out chopped from down there. So who knows, maybe after all there are intensive uh, excavations going on. We just don't know about it. So actually we have really lots of buildings, uh, dozens and actually hundreds that are built in the mysterious Baalbek style. It's actually not mysterious. As such, it simply doesn't fit the official stories we are told about the so-called Roman and ancient Greek style of construction and then the uh, so-called neoclassical. So uh, when we are fed with such wrong um, ideas to uh, classify things to start with, then it becomes very difficult to find out the truth. Ancient Greek style, what does it mean? This is extremely confusing. There are more um, buildings, much more impressive and much greater in numbers in this style in Turkey and in Asia, minor as wool than in uh, Greece as such. Why is it called Greek? It's not, it has not been invented in Greece as well, because, as we saw in the first episode of The Survivors, the culture that we classify as ancient Greek was nothing else than the later stages of uh, decay of this uh, older and more advanced culture, I call them the survivors or the nature people. In the beginning, when they still had some of the old knowledge, they could build things the size of a Baalbek. And all over Asia Minor we have very uh, impressive buildings. People in general just don't know about them, because they are being treated as minor, insignificant local history, while the so-called ancient Greek and ancient Roman are considered world history. And this um, so-called Roman style of architecture, this is again extremely misleading labeling, because neither Rome nor the alleged fantasy Roman Empire had anything to do with inventing this uh, style. That's why it is found in much greater concentration in Asia Minor, where much more buildings in this style, much bigger building blocks are to be found. It's absolutely ridiculous to believe that uh, Rome was center of all this. The Roman emperors, their magnificent palaces are built of mud bricks. So what, they commissioned buildings of much higher quality and built of uh, solid stone in the very periphery of um, their alleged Roman Empire, because there are no direct proofs of its existence actually, uh, in areas that were uh, right on the edge of this imaginary empire and that they actually uh, supposedly ruled for a very short time, uh, very short periods of uh, constant war and upheaval. So they didn't build their own city and they sent uh, all their best builders at the battlefield to hastily construct magnificent buildings in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. For more details, see the Roman Empire episode of the Survivors.
For example, Istanbul is rich or used to be very rich in ruins of style we would call ancient Greek and ancient Roman, but the policy, the international policy is not to restore them, to diminish the historic value of the regions which are actually rich in heritage and artificially enhance the authority of Western Europe just because its current rulers want to be considered leaders of innovation and leaders, masterminds of uh, civilization, which they are not. For example, uh, this is a 3D model of a palace, a minor palace in Istanbul. When this is in uh, Italy, of course, it will be uh, restored with high quality and it will be all over the tourist brochures. So, even in the age of photography, there were parts of the palace, of the Bukolian palace, still standing. And then very quickly, literally in front of our eyes, uh, what these are the huts on the place of the palace, where the dogs are, that, that used to be the palace. And what happened to its uh, parts? Here you see the columns and the uh, engraved borders. This is what happened to them. And this uh, has become the fate of many magnificent ephedeses just because uh, they are in Western Asia where they don't uh, enhance the authority of Western Europe. And in more recent times, uh, USA, of course, that's an extension of this uh, very same party of Western Europe that organizes all this. If you walk around uh, on the streets of uh, Cusco, even nowadays, on the sides of the street you will see amazing examples of uh, polygonal megalithic stonework, and so was it till very recent time in West Asia. And as we saw, the stories they are telling us about the so-called uh, neoclassical style in building are very, very fishy, because the same type of buildings they are telling us people were building in the span of over 2000 years, and these were people totally unconnected with each other. That's of course ridiculous. And we saw in the video about the Nimrod fortress, uh, Roman buildings, on the top of something uh, that they would classify as being built by the Templar Knights just 1000 years ago. While in reality the uh, ruins show that the so-called neoclassical style was nothing else but the last stages of uh, developing of this building style of the nature people, of the survivors. And that is why the colonial forces, the so-called colonial forces, quickly burned the summer palace in China because it was in the wrong style. It shouldn't be over there in that area. Of course, the ordinary soldiers who were carrying out the orders, they had completely different things in mind. They thought they are fighting for a good cause, even love of their own motherland, or maybe even inspirational religious quotes. And the Summer Palace is not uh, just uh, one isolated example. All the older layers of the civilization of the survivors are present all the way in China as well. This is also China, the same style. And this is as uh, well in China. It's not as uh, huge and impressive as uh, the megaliths in the other parts of the world, but it's definitely the same style with the same holes as usual. And this is uh, this same building from another angle. Notice again that it has built it has been built on top of the oldest layer of survivor ruins, the rock cut style ruins. And this is very important. I've been showing the same sequence all over Asia, Europe and Africa and maybe even America. This is your polygonal stonework in Korea.
And even in Indonesia, and not only the polygonal stonework, but also the typical slant, the angle of the slant seems to be the same as the similar buildings all over the world. And here is your Peruvian, Turkish looking polygonal stonework now in Greece. So what I'm getting at, this was a worldwide culture. There is a clear connection. It's not just one parallel. The parallels are so numerous. The slants, the polygonal uh, um, style, the lack of mortar, the perfect fitting of the stones, and so many other elements. And most importantly, the old techniques were never lost. We knew how to do exactly this stonework till very, very recent times, even during the age of photography. Perfect examples of that would be Fort Gorazda and the mysterious polygonal wall in the village of Chusovoy. You can see my videos about them. And the video about the French aqueducts would be also relevant to all this. And the other very interesting example from Siberia, when they were rebuilding it. So you can see what they were building. It is clearly in neoclassical style. And how are they building it? They're casting it out, out of the materials that they can find in the surroundings. The history of uh, cement and casting out of it, the official one, is total and shameless lie. And it has been very important for the forces of evil to make us forget these environmentally friendly techniques, so that we become cornered and totally dependent on uh, building methods which only use selected polluting materials, uh, materials that can be only obtained from the central supply, so to say. They want to sever every possible connection we have with Mother Nature to make us totally dependent on devilish technologies. Also, they want us to forget how to make durable and beautiful homes so that we are forced to live in ugly, polluted uh, flats which fall apart in a couple of decades. Also, this will keep us busy rebuilding them all the time so that we don't have time to sit and think about who are we, why do we incarnate our souls here. And so at the end we will even forget to ask this question, is it possible to even live on a clean planet in peace? So let me show you a few more photographs illustrating what happens to ruins when they are at the wrong place, that doesn't fit the stories we are told. So this is the first photograph of a palace that uh, used to be in the outskirts of St. Petersburg in Russia. And then, as usual, bad luck strikes. This is the next photograph of it. And this is how it looks nowadays. So, the palace was built a couple of hundred years ago. Of course, we are told it was built out of stone, but when you go on the spot there, surprise, surprise, there are bricks within the stone. It's actually cast out of uh, beton, cement, geopolymer, whatever you wish you can call it. And even armature sticks out from the so-called natural stones. These are some other old photographs from St. Petersburg. This is what it is left from all this now. But what is more interesting uh, here is not the building, but the palms growing in this currently extremely cold area. No question of palms anywhere near around there. And this is not the only photograph with palms. They used to be also in Moscow on old photographs. 
Also, elephants were used in Russia in the fields. It was so warm before. And that's all in the age of photography. I don't know what uh, should I make out of all that, but for me the most reasonable explanation so far is the hypothesis of Alexei Kungurov that um, actually we are not experiencing this global warming that we are being lied about we just uh, ha had a very short period of extremely cold weather because of the large number of very harmful nuclear tests that were uh, carried out in the past decades now they stopped with all that they are developing even more devilish technologies so it is getting warmer a bit warmer at least I'm not saying that this is all that there is to it, to the current climate changes that we are experiencing. Actually, I think this is a very, very small part of it, only in recent times. In terms of the big picture, first of all, it should be clear that we are not experiencing global warming. This is uh, not at all a problem as such. Actually, the weather is getting uh, a bit more pleasant. We are experiencing crazier weather recently and that's a different thing and actually a few things have been coming to my mind lately in terms of the bigger picture about all these uh, climate changes that we are going through i mean the real ones not the scam that you hear about from the newspapers and tv so as i showed in a couple of videos made last year when they are telling us that the ice age ended, they are saying it's some whatever 10, 11, 12,000 years ago. Actually, that's when it started. Before that, real scientists, they, uh, as I show in the video, an interview with Alexander Kultepin, what they actually find in the layers which uh, belong to the period which ended allegedly 11, 12,000 years ago is uh, lush tropic greenery, warmed, loving animals, very pleasant weather on both poles. And then all of a sudden everything froze down. And then I'm connecting this with the Nordic legends about the frost giants. Because on the other hand, in some of the survivors episodes I showed evidence, especially in Siberia, the things looked as if they froze, like all of a sudden within minutes. So now I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, but this is exactly what the Nordic legend, actually maybe it's a real history, the Nordic history of our race is telling us the evil people, they froze us, I mean, momentarily to death. Just like that in an instant. I didn't even connect all this when I was showing the evidence that the regions were frozen in an instant and yeah there is a good reason for which the evil forces which currently rule the planet are very worried that it may get warmer and pleasant that the earth weather may come back to balance and don't worry if that happens it won't submerge half of the continents and the water that is just one of the endless lies that they are filling our brains with. Another one is to blame the carbon dioxide for the crazy and extreme weather that we are experiencing lately. This is just a clever trick to blame a natural element which is actually beneficial for plants and in this way further clog our minds with intellectual garbage information so that we can't even think about what is actually going on and what is actually going on humanity unaware of its real history is falling in the same traps it fell many times before so again as i was looking at the old photos of syria my god these people look exactly like 
my forefathers, I myself was born in the region of the Balkans. This is how my grandparents lived. If somebody tells me these are photographs from their village, I would completely believe it. The people look the same, the buildings, the outfits, everything is the same. So this worldwide culture of the nature people, of the survivors, it was here not very long ago. And we are being convinced, lied to by TV, by mass media, that we are different that we have to fight over cultural and religious differences which are actually only artificially manufactured just to make us go to war, make us fight and we believe it. And then the result makes no sense to us. This man is thinking, oh my god, I went to war out of love to my country, to my religion and why the result is like this, death and destruction. How can evil be result of love? The problem is that we are brainwashed. What is love all about? Here they are showing us a pretty face of a woman just to make us swallow the destruction all around, accept it as something natural. And the same with history. Everybody has heard about the Great Wall of China. Big volumes of information about it, but sadly somehow people don't know the main thing, that most of it is being built very recently or right now only for tourist purpose, just to distract our attention from the real old and interesting walls. And at the end I want to show you shortly very interesting video material again from Peter Saitoridi, taken somewhere in what is now an accessible war zones in the Middle East. I don't even know where is it. I couldn't even find the official name of the site. It is uh, supposed officially to be Canaan Rock Cut Complex, something like that. But it doesn't even matter how they call it, because there are no inscriptions, there is no definite proof what it is actually, so does it even matter how they call it? So the older layer consists as usual of uh, rock cut ruins, quarry style, quite an impressive height by the way. And again, this uh, round, they look to me like uh, wounds, like um, as if some weapon has been hitting it. Very few researchers even address this issue. Why are they found always on very old historic sites and always on sites that, that don't fit well? with the official stories that they are telling us. I don't even hear any reasonable hypothesis except being a trace of some sort of weapon. Somebody tried to suggest that they might be like places for cooking. I don't know, sometimes they are found by thousands next to each other. Heroic cooking must have been going on in this this place, I mean, something like uh, cooking for obelix and asterix or something like that. So the quarry-like cuttings are identical to those found all the way from Spain to China. Just absolutely same style. And then we have something that looks like rock-cut tombs. So are they really burial chambers or not? I, I don't know for sure. But what is interesting is that they are one-to-one -one copy to the same structures that we saw in Italy and also Spain. This I want to show you in all my videos that this was a culture spread over continents, a single culture. Look at this alleged necropolis. It's an absolute one-to-one -one copy to the same things that are in Italy labeled as Etruscan and in Turkey labeled as Lycian. 
including the symbols they used, the sun symbols, the oldest one found on the rock cut ruins. They are also same everywhere you go with this culture. And the border, look at the border, the decoration element of this alleged Canaan necropolis. This is one to one, what we call Etruscan border here in Europe. Even minor details are identical. Look at this T-shaped kind of a gate or whatever. How come the Etruscans, which supposedly were simple people, not traveling to the Middle East daily, how come they made the same design gates? With the same T-shaped border on the top. And by the way, we have the same design in Egypt. And even here, all the way in Libya, we see identical borders, not just similar, but identical, on identical rock-cut tombs. And probably I see some hint, maybe even the border is again T-shaped. The internal space design also absolutely identical, the columns 100% identical. So I've been showing you such examples by hundreds in my videos so far and the main point is there has been a almost worldwide culture that doesn't even have a name. It's completely absent in the mainstream history and that's why this so-called history should not be believed at all. And here on the side of the door, Peter said to really noticed um, some peculiar tool marks, identical to those found on the lower layers of the stonework in Castle Montfort. To him, they look like traces of uh, some. Uh, something similar to our high-tech tools now that uh, hit the stone very swiftly. The team of Lai, the Russian laboratory for alternative history, they also saw this type of uh, tool marks on, uh, at a number of spots in the Middle East and uh, their group, they're usually like at least 10 people when they travel, they would be like half, half, uh, half of them would think it's a high-tech tool and the rest uh, would find it resembling more uh, something like a chisel. So since I mentioned the rock cut uh, ruins in Libya, let's see a few more images from that region because I've been showing the same thing hundred times in Asia and Europe. Let's see some of it from Africa. All these ruins are in the vicinity of Tripoli, the capital. The oldest layer is uh, again rock cut, they call it tombs. Many of them look like dwellings, actually. So, as shown by the similarity in the architectural elements, like the borders, even in earliest times, when people were still cutting their uh, premises in the rock, there was still one worldwide civilization. And then, gradually, the rock cut turned into somewhat rough-looking megalithic work. These are images from this very same region near Tripoli. As you can see, the ruins are like uh, those of Stonehenge, but because they were unlucky to be in Libya, they, as far as I understand, they, they don't even exist anymore. But when they are found in England, they are world famous, of course. And then at the end, these people started the building in what is commonly known as Roman style. This is the Temple of Zeus.
or Leptis Magna again in Libya, an entire city built in this style, with way more ruins than Rome in Italy itself, and yet the mainstream penguins have managed to somehow put it in such context that it will look Roman, as if the credit goes again to Western Europe. So while browsing the photographs from the Libyan rocket ruins, something caught my attention. Look at these stones in the front. At first sight, they look as if these are natural fractions in the stones. But yet on the other hand, the rest of the stone around doesn't seem to fracture this way. It seems as if it wants to stay as it is. So are these megalithic blocks after all? It is hard to say, judging only from photographs about this site in particular, but in my previous videos I showed you absolutely same looking sites in Armenia, Turkey and Spain, and those have been examined and have been confirmed that these are actually megalithic blocks, and they look absolutely the same. So what is this all about? I don't know, but until now I don't have any line of thinking to pursue except uh, the one that I expressed in relation to the meltalits. There are a couple of videos about meltalits on my channel and over there I show a lot of structures that are also on the border between natural and man-made or intelligent made. And new relevant information in this regard came from the Lai expedition to Baalbek last year. They went to Baalbek again to see the new excavations. The access to the Trilitons on the walls is by the way now cut off with the green gate on the left hand side. But luckily the newly dug out Trilitons are still accessible to public. And they noticed a very curious naturally looking crack in the stone exactly where the Triton, which is kind of still attached to the bedrock, should get cut off. So this curious track, if you examine just a small portion of it, it looks perfectly natural. But when uh, looking around in the area, one finds out that, that this stone doesn't crack naturally like this. And this natural looking crack is just found only below the Triliton. Did the builders of the Triliton know some sort of magic that would make the stone crack wherever they want it? Exactly where they want it? Well, if that was so, it will just add one more mystery to Baalbek. It won't solve any of the existing ones which are very well illustrated by these shots taken with the micro mode of the camera. They show the precision with which the borders were made, and especially the places where the stones fit with each other perfectly, without any distance in between them. Well, I never studied Baalbek myself, but um, the best studies done so far are definitely those of uh, the late Andreis Klarov and his uh, group that I am referring to as Lai. And for now, their conclusions in terms of the technology that was used in Baalbek are that um, absolutely primitive means were used along with the uh, technology which is uh, far beyond our current understanding. That's why we see very primitive uh, looking tool marks in the quarry and then at the places where the stone meets we see an amazing precision that uh, we don't do nowadays when we work with stone.
And just by casually browsing photographs of uh, citadels in the region, again, this is in Syria, the fortress itself uh, looks like it is built in the later stages. Um, although it is in the same style as the Nimrod fortress as Baalbek, but the stones are not as big. But what I noticed is that uh, what they call nowadays moat looks more like an ancient rocket road, actually. Just look at its uh, sheer height and also at its uh, coloring. Is The stone is much darker than the stones of the fortress. And when people will, were building uh, fortresses with uh, s such small stones, they were not doing a rock cutting the height of a, I don't know how many stories. So who knows, maybe this uh, citadel is yet another out of the many that was built on much older rock cut ruins. Well, certainly this uh, region is very rich in very old history. I hope I can uh, really fulfill my intention and make an expedition to this region in the autumn this year.